Good evening, students. We will be uh, looking at cost of capital chapter today. Previously, we looked at the valuation of uh, shares. I'm sure like you would have got some idea and study pack could support you in understanding some of the things what we discussed. Today, we will discuss on the cost of capital. Before straight away moving on to cost of capital, just to give you an idea, what are the sources of finance? Sources of finance generally a company could use. Company could use. Starting from shareholder funds, starting from shareholder funds, shareholder funds. Then we have the main debt capital, which is debentures, debentures. Then you get the long term loans, long term loans. Then we have the other debt instruments, I am not uh, naming the one by one, debentures and long term loan. Then we have this preference shares. Generally, you would see in a private company, preference shares are still in use, preference shares. And the short term loans, we will discuss that in little while. So, if you take the main sources of funds, shareholder funds, where it can be your stated capital, stated capital, and then your retained earnings retain earnings even though the reserves form the shareholder funds in terms of funding in terms of funding these are two uh, ways of funding stated capital and retain earning but if you take the from calculation point of view you would see when you learn this even the other reserves are considered part of reserves or oh, sorry shareholder funds so we will include under shareholder funds but in terms of funding, actually the cash is uh, used or cash represented used is of stated capital and retain earnings. So, these are the common sources of finance the company has in terms of long term nature, long term nature. Even the short term loans when I mention, it, even though it is accounting purposes, it is a short term loans. There are instances the company uses the short term loans for a long term purposes, long term purposes. If they are used as a long term purposes, even though it is short term in your accounting, this is also a long term debt capital or long term capital from the source of finance. For example, now say you have taken a short term loan, three months you would have taken, but if you really look at it last five years in your balance sheet, the company had been using this short term loan. So, in other words, you are dependent on this short term loan and you cannot ignore that. In your running your organization, you cannot ignore this short term loan. It is a part of your funding for long term nature. Since it is a long term purpose that you are using this short term loan, this is also long term capital, long term capital. So, please keep in mind that short term loans, even though we say it is a in accounting purpose, it is short term in your balance sheet, but if you are using it for longer term, longer period, then it becomes a long term purpose, it is a long term nature loans. So, these are key short uh, sources of finance the company could be using. Now, we all know that each source of finance has its pluses and minuses, I am not taking today that discussion. These so, uh, sources of finance as definitely a cost. Why? If you are a company taking the money from these sources, definitely there is a cost involved, definitely a cost involved to use these funds. So, what is that cost? That is called cost of capital. The money what you are using in order to run your organization, various sources you are using, each source has a cost. That cost is the cost of capital. So, we will discuss that in one by one, how this cost is working. So, the cost of capital, cost of capital, companies, companies cost of funds, 
So, if the company is cost of funds, company using the funds of whatever we are talking or the sources, company is cost is cost of capital. Other side, you will have investors, investors who have given money, investors require rate of return, investor who have given money is expecting a return, you can call it expected return or required rate of return. So, you will see that investors who have given money to the organization he is expecting a return, that return is also called cost of capital. On the other hand, company has taken money from various sources for which he has to incur a cost, that is also cost of capital. So, you might slightly confuse yourself what I am talking. Now, say you are taking a loan, you are taking a loan from the bank. Now, bank loan when you take, you have an agreement with the bank where it very clearly says what is the cost of the loan you are taking. So, it is very clear for loan the interest, the interest component is how much say 15 percent or 12 percent whatever number which is given in the loan agreement very clear. So, everyone knows okay this is the cost, this is the cost of the loan. So, there is no doubt or no one has to judge any amounts, it is simply based on the agreement you can find out the interest cost. So, that is what we are saying company cost of funds. So, if you take the loan, company knows what is the cost of my loan, so that is my cost of capital for the loan. So, that is very clear. So, any loan kind of transactions, most of the time you are very clear what is my cost from company point of view. But if you take the shareholder funds, shareholder funds, there is generally a perception, not from the students I am saying, perception even in the corporate world, some of the people who are non-finance people generally think the shareholder funds no cost. Why? Shareholder funds mean what? You have invested in a company where you get a share certificate. Maybe now in a listed market you do not have a share certificate, it is basically a electronic form document, right? So, shareholder funds, it is share capital what you have invested, you do not get any document or you do not say an agreement to say that how much the cost you are going to be paid. So, the shareholders when they invest money in shares, which could be a unlisted company or listed company, shareholder thinks okay, I am going to get a return, but there is no document to say how much return you are going to get for your shareholder money. You may be put 10,000 rupees or 1 million rupees, which definitely you are expecting a return, you are expecting a return required rate of return is there for your money because your money has opportunity cost. But there is no document to say how much cost they are going to pay you. That is why we said the cost of capital has two phases. One is very straightforward cost where it is like loan agreement. Other one is shareholder funds where it is calculated, the cost is calculated by understanding what is required rate of return of the investor or the expected return of the investor. So, shareholder funds, the expected expected return of the investor, expected return of the investor is actually the cost of capital of a shareholder funds. So, I believe that you are clear, here two sides we are talking, one is very straightforward cost where you might see is agreement or a document which clearly says the rate. So, you are very clear, what is the cost of my funds, what I am using for the company. The on the other hand, I have some more funds which are shareholder funds where there is no agreement to say how much it cost. Every shareholder invests in the company expecting a return, but there is no uh, mutual understanding between the parties where there will be a cost they are paying or even you do not have a assurance that they will pay that return. If you go and buy in the share market the shares, you are expecting a return, but there is no one tells you how much you are going to get. So, you are only expecting. So, the expected return of the investors for the shareholder funds is the cost of capital. So, please note the cost of capital has two sides of it. Some side is the company cost where you are very clear about the documentation, agreements will show the cost. The other side investor required rate of return. So, we need to say the cost of capital when we, we do go into detail, you have to see that there is a always the possibility of expected return of the investor represent the cost of capital.
then moving from there we need to understand this cost of capital is actually another way of looking at is the opportunity cost opportunity cost this is specially for shareholder funds specially for shareholder funds the expected return of the investor expected return of the investor is the opportunity cost of the investor opportunity cost of the investor if the investor has two alternatives of investment he decides to invest in a instead of b so the b is foregoing the return so what is foregoing return is called opportunity cost that is the cost of investing in a so similarly everywhere whenever you go to invest your money what you have definitely has opportunity cost why if you have invested that money into a, one of the opportunity you would have got so much of money so that money you are going to lose that's becoming your opportunity cost so please note the shareholder funds whenever we have the investors have opportunity cost investors have opportunity cost that's the expected return on the other hand for the from the investor point of view which is the cost of capital for shareholder funds then moving to i think i am referring to chapter 9 in your study pack study pack your cost of capital cost of capital could be representing could be representing your risk free rate risk free rate plus business risk premium plus financial risk premium so you will have to understand that you will have risk free rate plus business risk premium and financial risk premium this forms the cost of capital from number point of view risk free rate mean what the return you generally get from government securities where there is no risk there is no risk in the instrument so government securities will give you a risk free rate if you invest in treasury bill or bond you are getting a return say 5% today context that 5% you are sure of getting it so therefore it's risk free the investment will not be defaulted by the government so there is a risk free investment so there is a return of 5% so for example you have 5% on risk free and you would like to have a premium for the business risk of the company if you are going to invest in x limited x limited that business has a risk compared to any other thing the business on its own when they are in that business industry they will have a risk so for that risk you might say i want a premium of 3% you might decide okay i want the 3% extra from the risk free rate to compensate the businesses what i am going to take by investing in that company similarly i would say okay i need to have a premium for financial risk so another four percentage i might need total i would say my cost of capital or my recurrent of return is 12 percentage which is the my return expectation to invest in the company so this is something uh, arbitrary numbers i have put but what the logic here is if you are going to invest in any share market or any unlisted company that investment you need a return that return forms the cost of capital so the return is how much that return has three component one is risk free rate you would like to have minimum risk free rate plus business risk premium to, to invest in business you need to take a risk that business risk whatever it may be certain certain industries are more business risk having more risk other industries may have lesser business risk so you go and decide for example uh, food then food items right if you are talking about food industry you might see there is a lesser risk compared to maybe a industry where you have to see like tourism industry if you are going to invest in a tourism company hotels company you take more risk than the food industry these days why you are sure of the income over the next period and here you are doubtful of the income so therefore your risk levels are varies so business risk will vary depends on the organization industry or nature then a financial risk which is purely based on the capital structure of the company capital structure of the company what i mean by capital structure you have equity capital and debt capital in any company so what is the component of equity what is the component of debt capital in your capital structure so that financial risk will be more when you have more debt capital in your capital structure that mean your gearing is very high then your financial risk is higher 
if your finance, if your gearing is lower, that means your debt capital is lower, your finance risk is lower. So depends on the capital structure of your company, you will have to decide what is extra premium I want. So a 70% debt capital company, you would need more risk premium than a 20% debt capital in a company. So you have to compare the company financial risk and agree on a premium in your mind. So total you have 12% pre expectation, that's your cost of capital. So please note this is a, another uh, calculational basis of your expected return from a share market or unlisted company. Then we will be looking at how to calculate cost of capital, how to calculate the cost of capital. So shall we look at first cost of equity cost of equity, we will first calculate cost of equity capital or cost of equity means shareholder funds, equity means shareholder funds, cost of equity, how do you calculate? There is a model called dividend valuation model, when we talked about under valuation chapter we looked at it, dividend valuation model, according to that cost of equity equals to, cost of equity equals to dividend divided by market value or market price. Right, dividend divided by market price, it's always X due price we call it, excluding the current year dividend, excluding the current year dividend. So dividend valuation model, right, cost of equity equals to dividend divided by market price. So that's the way of calculating the cost of equity for a company which has a constant dividend. Dividend valuation model is applicable for constant dividend, which means company is going to pay you, for example, year 1, year 2, year 3, like that, it goes to infinite period, same amount of dividend. Say 5 rupee dividend, it will be paid for entire future. So this is the dividend valuation model, calculation of cost of equity, dividend divided by market price. Then the second one, we can use the dividend growth model, what we learned on the valuation model, same thing, uh, we interchange variable, dividend growth model. Under dividend growth model, same cost of equity is calculated as DO 1 plus G DO 1 plus G market value or market price XDIV plus growth rate. So this is your dividend growth model where you can use to calculate cost of equity. So when you say cost of equity we are calculating cost of shareholder funds. Here we talked about dividend valuation model where constant dividend is there. In the dividend growth model as you know, the dividend have a constant growth rate. Please note, constant growth rate. So your constant growth rate will be there in your dividend growth model in calculating cost of equity. So these are in your study pack also. Please make sure that you are clear because uh, the cost of equity of the company could be calculated either using the dividend valuation model or dividend growth model depends on how the company pay dividends, how the company pay dividends. Some company pay dividends on a constant manner, that means equal dividend every year till infinite period. Some company pay dividends on a constant growth rate. If they give you say 5% growth last year to current year, current year to next year also same 5% they will have. So the growth will be constant every year. So if you have growth constantly, then your cost of equity calculation will be using the dividend growth model. Then the other third method, actually these are the two methods we generally use to calculate cost of equity. There is another important method which is actually very useful in your case study questions, case study questions to calculate cost of equity. So what is that? That is cost of equity using CAPA model, capital asset pricing model, it's a separate chapter, capital asset pricing model, accordingly the cost of equity is equals to risk free rate beta market return risk free rate. So what is this? Here, more than memorizing the formula, please understand what is this cost of equity. Cost of equity is the expected return, expected return of investor. When we say cost of equity, it's from company point of view. From company point of view, to use the shareholder funds, there is a cost. 
that's why we call it cost of equity but on the other hand this cost of equity is representing the shareholders or the investors expect a return investors when they put the money in the company they expect a return so the expected return of the investor is the cost of equity so you can say cost of equity or expected return of investor you want to calculate so expected return of investor mean what i am going to invest in share market in a company by company in that company how much i expect return what is what is my expected return so my expected return is risk free return risk free return whatever risk free return if that's a government security return generally government securities government securities return which is risk free plus i want a premium risk premium in order to invest in that company i want a risk premium now when you say this rm this is average market return average market return in share market or stock market you will see there is a average return given in the stock market that return minus risk free rate is called risk premium this is the entire market average risk premium we are calculating entire 200 or 90 290 companies average risk premium is market return average minus risk free then you multiply by beta what is beta which is the systematic systematic risk measurement systematic risk measurement of the company so if you are talking about you are investing in y company what is the y company risk in order to invest in y company what is the risk that is what is reflected by the beta so you multiply the beta by the risk premium then what you get actually this is risk premium risk premium specific specific to a company to a company so please note there are two risk premium we are talking about here one is the risk premium of the entire market if i am a i'm a investor who is going to invest in stock market i have to first accept i cannot get the risk free rate in stock market i should get more than that why i should get more because there is a risk premium that is the difference between these two why i should get more because market return should be more than risk free rate that's a theory so on that basis i am expecting a risk premium into invest in share market that's the average uh, risk premium but if i am going to invest in specific company that specific company risky levels or riskiness could be different to the entire market so what do i do i need to calculate that risk that is what beta reflect the specific risk of that company compared to market that risk you multiplied by the risk premium then you get the risk premium specific to a company so when i am going to invest in john keys or icons pens or elis or ambat bank commercial bank anywhere i have to find out what is the beta of that company that will give me the risk of that company that multiplied by risk premium then i get a risk premium what i require risk premium what i require to invest in specific company that risk premium plus risk free rate is what i expect from the market or the company the company where i am going to invest i want risk free rate plus the risk premium for the specific company that will tell me how much return i am expecting this expected return is actually the cost of equity also why cost of equity is from the company point of view expected return is from investor point of view so please note this is another or third method of calculating cost of equity which is very useful uh, in the corporate world if you are talking about valuation of company free cash flow based valuation this cost of equity is computed using capa model and you calculate your wacc and discount your cash flows so please note that this is more uh, used method of calculating cost of equity in the corporate world in addition to the what we learned dividend valuation dividend constant dividend and constant dividend growth method this is more important method compared to other two methods so please make sure that you are clearly taking it down so understand what is this capa model based calculation because every case study if you take the past papers all the case studies will have this capa model way of calculating cost of equity so you are very clear 
it is the expected return of the investor in order to invest in a company I need risk free return plus a premium how much a premium that is average market premium multiplied by beta that will give me risk premium to a specific to that company so whatever the risk premium of the specific company I will be requiring. For example, you say A, B, C, there are three companies, they have beta say 1.2, 1.4, 0.8 and the risk free rate, risk free rate say 6 percent per annum and the market return, market return you might say like uh, 12 percentage per annum. So, if you have three companies where an investor is going to invest, the betas are given and the risk-free rate is given, market return is given. Now, if I want to know what is the expected return, expected return of the investor, expected return of the investor or cost of equity, one of them. Both are same, expected return is from the investor point, cost of equity is from the company point of view. So, if you take the formula what we earlier looked at, risk free rate plus beta average market return minus risk free rate. So, if you take the risk free rate which is 6 percent, beta you have 3 beta for 3 companies, market return is 12 percentage minus 6 percent. So, we know that ok, the beta will be different from company to company. So, definitely your expected return of the investor or cost of equity will be varying simply because the riskiness of each company. So, what is the A company expected return? A company expected return. A company expected return will be 6 percent risk free rate, E wants beta is 1.2, again how much the amount? 7.2, 13.2. So, you multiply the gap between market return and risk free rate into 1.2, that is 7.2 plus 6, 13.2. So, in order to invest in a company you are requiring 13.2 percent return. In order to invest in A company you are requiring 13.2 percent return. Similarly, if you take the B, B company right B company again risk free rate of 6 percent plus 1.4 is your beta 12 minus 6. So, your return expectation will be 6 percent plus 8.4, so total is 14.4. So, expected return in B is 14.4 percent. Third one C, I write it here, 6 percent there is free rate plus your 0 0.8 beta, 12 minus 6. So, your return will be 6 percent plus 4 percentage into 0 0.8, that is 3.2 percent, not 4 percent. 6 percentage into 0 0.8, 6 percentage into 0 0.8, that is 4.8, 4.8 plus 10, sorry 6, 10.8 percent. So, you could see here expected return from the investor point, A company you require 13.2, B company you require 14.4, C company you require 10.8. Now, what do you observe here? which company you need, which company as an investor you will require more return. As an investor from which company you are going to expect more return? The company which has more risk. The beta is the risk measurement. Systematic, systematic risk measurement. So, beta is systematic risk measurement. So, as an investor you see a, B, C, there are three companies I have to invest. A company has 1.2 beta, B company 1.4, C company 0 0.8, which means C company is lowest risk out of three. B company is the highest risk, right. So, by B company represents highest risk out of the three company investment opportunity. So, as an investor, I need to decide, okay, how much my expected return going to be. So, how much I am going to expect 
the company which has higher risk, I would need highest risk, I would need more return. I am requiring more return, so 14.4% I require from B company. The company which has the lowest risk, I don't want the same return what I expect from B company because it is the lowest risk, so I would be comfortable with lower return expectation which is 108 So please note, A, B, C, three companies, three returns are here, lowest risk company, I expect lowest return. Highest return, highest risk company, I expect higher return. So generally we have a understanding that risk can return what relationship? If risk is higher, you expect a return also higher. Please take down this. If the risk is higher in any investment opportunity, the expected return is all higher. Similarly, if the risk is lower in any investment opportunity, your expected return is also low. Expected return, it's not a guaranteed return. Your expected return will be lower. So please note, depends on the beta or the riskiness of each company, your expected return, return varies. So this is the CAPM model based calculation of cost of equity or expected return. The expected return is from investor point, same thing from company point cost of equity. This is the one which will be used mostly in your case study questions where uh, the company cash flows will be evaluated or discounted using a cost of equity or WACZ. In order to calculate cost of equity, we use the CAPM model based calculation because these are more comprehensive and which relates the the investor return to the riskiness of the project, riskiness of the investment. So based on the riskiness, your expected return vary. You have to be very clear here, based on the riskiness, your expected returns are varying. So the lower risk, lowest risk one, you expect lower return, higher risk one investment, you expect higher return. So please note, this is basically reflection of CAPM model calculating cost of equity. So that basically are the ones how to calculate cost of equity. Then moving to the second cost of capital which is cost of preference shares. Cost of preference shares. Cost of preference shares. So all of us know that preference shares has a feature of uh, having preference over the other capital. What the preference you get in a preference share capital is one, in terms of paying dividends, the company needs to pay dividend to preference shareholders before paying the preference share, sorry, owner shareholders. Similarly, when it comes to the liquidation or winding up of the company, preference shareholders will get the money first before getting the before the owner shareholder getting the money at the winding up or liquidation. So please note that this is the reason why it's called preference shares. So in general, uh, private companies have preference share capital. So there is a, a return attached to the preference share capital, maybe 7%, 10% like that. The company will say okay, when they give the preference share certificate or when they get the money for preference share capital, they say what is the return they are going to pay. So calculating the cost of preference share capital. If the company uses the preference share capital in their sources, what is the cost of preference share? So cost of preference shares will be like your dividend valuation model for owner share cost of equity, dividend divided by market value. Market value again x div, that is the current year dividend is excluded. So cost of preference share will be dividend divided by market value x div. So this is a constant dividend valuation model what we looked at for the ordinary share capital. Same thing for cost of preference shares. So dividend divided by market value. Generally preference shares are not listed, generally not listed. So therefore your dividend divided by market value is a book value also. But if the preference shares are listed, then you will have a market value take the market price or market value and compare the dividend for the year, one year dividend and calculate cost of preference share. So these are calculating the cost of preference share. Third one or the C is your cost of debt, cost of debt. Now we have debt capital. As I mentioned, if you have taken the bank loan, bank loan, it's not seriously you calculate the cost of debt. Why? Very clear the agreement will say 15% loan interest. 
So there is nothing that you will calculate. You take the agreement, you know the cost. But when you come to the other instrument, for example, debenture. This debt instrument, if you say it is a debenture, right? So the, what do you mean by debenture? This is a long term instrument, long term instrument issued by company to raise money. Now we have government bonds, government bonds. What is that? It is a long term debt instrument, borrowing instrument issued by government. Government bond is government issues the bond, debenture instrument and they raise the money for their whatever requirements. So government is issuing a debt instrument to borrow money from investors for their purpose. Same thing you will see corporates, private corporates, not the government institution, private corporates can issue, can issue long term instrument in order to borrow money, in order to borrow money. So when they are issuing instrument long term nature to borrow money which are called corporate bonds, we can call it corporate bonds or debentures. So, you will see this word called debentures most often in corporate world than the corporate bonds. But the corporate bond is same as the debentures, which is a long term debt instrument issued by the company to raise money. So, you will generally have in debentures, it has a maturity period, it has a very clear maturity period. So, you might say like okay, 5 years or even 3 years, say 7 years. So, you have maturity period. And the coupon rate will be mentioned. Coupon rate is the interest rate. Coupon rate is the interest rate. The government or the co corporate will be paying the customers. It can be annually paid or semi annually paid corporate bonds. So, you will have coupon rate where I may be saying the rate how much 10 percent, 5 percent like that. Apart from that, there is a word called face value, face value, which is where your debentures, debentures will have a face value. Face value is your nominal value. If it is a thousand rupee or hundred rupee, it's your face value or nominal value. Similarly, you will have maturity value that is at the redemption five years time, the company will give the document back and take, uh, give the money back and take the document back, right? So at the time of issuing the debenture, company is issuing the instrument, debt instrument, uh, that is a debenture document and raising the money, company getting the money, investor giving the money, company getting the money. On the maturity date, that is five years down the road, company will be paying back to the investor their money back, apart from whatever they have paid coupon rate over the period, five years or whatever interest they would have paid, plus they pay the redemption date, the capital. So please note, there is something called face value and maturity value. So the maturity value that the redemption they will pay. So these are just to give you an idea what is this debentures is all about. So we want to calculate cost of debt. The cost of debt can be two types. One is redeemable, redeemable. Other one is irredeemable, irredeemable. So your debentures could be redeemable or irredeemable debentures. Irredeemable mean no maturity period, no maturity period. Redeemable is it can have a very clear cut fixed, fixed redemption period, fixed redemption period. So please note your debentures issued by the company could be having a very clear fixed redemption period. Say example, example say five years, very clear. You have five years time, your debentures are redeemed. Other one is no redeemable date, that means no maturity date you will be having for infinite period. So the cost of debt, when you want to calculate the cost of this debenture instrument. So this debenture instrument which is generally, which, which is generally listed. If you take in Sri Lanka, most of the debentures are issued by corporate banks. Banks have issued debentures and these debentures are to great extent listed debentures. Right, the banks or finance companies are issued debenture in Sri Lanka. There are a few other than non-banking banking sector, only few in corporates have issued debentures. So you would see that debentures have been issued by these institutions to borrow money from the investors and they have given a clear period of redemption period. So very rarely you see a irredeemable bond. Very rarely you see a redeemable one. Maybe a private company might have issued a debenture and said that irredeemable debenture. 
but otherwise you will always have a renewable debenture. Now, how do you calculate cost of debt, cost of this instrument? Since these debentures, renewable debentures are listed, listed, you will have a market value also, market value also. If it is unlisted, no market value, it is uh, only the face value or the book value. So, how do you calculate cost of debt of renewable and irredeemable? Irredeemable, it is easy. Cost of your debenture or debt, we call it, cost of debenture or cost of debt is interest divided by market value. Market value again x interest, current interest is excluded. So, you get the market price of the debenture and take the interest for the year, one year interest divided by market value will be cost of debt. When you see there is a tax benefit you will have for your interest, your cost of debt is after tax or you can call it cost of debt net, cost of debt after tax which is interest 1 minus tax divided by same market value x interest. So, please note for irredeemable debenture your cost of debt is i divided by market value x interest or i 1 minus tax. If there is a taxation in the corporate world, i 1 minus tax divided by market value. Redeemable debentures, redeemable debenture, your cost of debt is not based on formula. You need to calculate IRR of the debenture. So, you have to calculate IRR, you know internal rate of return. That is the cost of the redeemable debenture. So, you take the 5 year period debenture cash flows, your debenture money what you have got and what you are paying interest 5 years and the redemption in the end then calculate the IRR that will be the cost of debt. So, please note cost of debt can be uh, based on with the irredeemable debenture or irredeemable debenture. Irredeemable debenture it is the formula to be calculated. Redeemable debenture it is the IRR of the cost. So, please note that this is the cost of debt calculation. So, we have looked at cost of equity, cost of preferentials and cost of debt. Then we have the mix of all these three capital, which is called weighted average cost of capital, weighted average cost of capital. So, weighted average cost of capital is what? This is the cost of, cost of pooled funds pooled funds. Why we call it pooled funds? Because when you raise money from the investor, the company take it from shareholders, company can take it from debt holders or that is debenture holders, company could be using the preference shareholders money. So, it is a mix of various capital. So, when you take various capital for usage in the company, you are not going to separate this capital in the bank account saying that this is a shareholder money, this is a debt holder money. It is all these monies are together that is a pool funds. So, when you take the company funds, it is pool. So, it is all together. So, when you are going to invest in any project, when you are going to invest in project, we want to do, decide what is my cost of capital to evaluate my project. In order to evaluate my project, I am very, I have to be very clear what cost of funds I am going to use. So, since the company will be using the pool funds, where all the funds together, from that time I am going to invest in the project, I need to decide what is my average cost. So, the average cost is the weighted average cost of capital. So, please note we calculated earlier cost of equity separately, cost of preference share separately and cost of debt after tax separately. So, we are three individual, individual mean each capital we are separate cost. All these costs are going to be mixed up now and we calculate this weighted every cost of capital. So, I believe that you are clear that different sources of funds have been used by the company to invest in project. So, we cannot say what is the cost of these funds what I am going to invest in the A project. The A project must be used by different co sources. So, I need to take average cost of that. What is the average cost? That is weighted every cost of capital. 
So, how do we calculate this? So, the weighted area cost of capital could be calculated, could be calculated cost of equity, cost of equity into the your equity component, equity component. If you say you have equity component and debt component in the company, cost of equity into equity divided by equity plus debt plus cost of debt after tax into debt capital divided by equity plus debt. So, if you have preference share capital, you can add that also, right? Cost of preference shares multiplied by your preference share amount divided by equity plus debt plus preference share. So, here also you will add the preference share as the capital. So, you need to know that we are going to calculate cost of equity multiplied by equity component out of total capital cost of debt into debt component out of total capital, cost of preference shares multiplied by preference share out of total capital. So, we will calculate accordingly. So, you may refer in the study pack, the weighted area cost of capital, page number 255, page number 255, which basically gives you the WACC computation with the preference shares and without preference shares. So, please note, this is how you calculate WACC. Whenever we calculate WACC, two things to be remembered. One, we need to use market values. We need to use market values. This equity debt preference share values, equity debt preference shares values have to be market value. If you are not given market value in the question or even in the practical scenarios, you may have to use the book value, but advisable is to use the market value. Second, your cost of debt, cost of debt is always after tax. Cost of debt has to be after tax. So, please be aware that your market values are used in the calculation and cost of debt has to be after tax. If you do not have market value, you may go for book value calculation. Okay. So, this is a WACC computation. We can calculate. Most of the time, you will have debt and equity only. You do not have preference shares. So, you do not worry much about the preference shares. But if you have it, even the formula is what I will, what we have looked at. The other thing is, whenever we calculate WACC, and use it for investment appraisal. WAC we calculate and use it for investment appraisal. If you are using it for investment appraisal, the WACC, generally, generally, there are few assumptions, few assumptions we make. Whenever we are using WACC in order to evaluate any projects or investments, we are making assumptions. Without our knowledge, we make the assumptions. So, what are assumptions? One, we believe that your present business risk, your project or whatever the company now running, that business risk, present risk, present business risk and new project, new project business risk are same. Present business risk and new business risk are same. This is an assumption we make while we are calculating the project evaluation of feasibility using the WACC. It may not be true, but we assume whenever we use WACC, present WACC to evaluate, we make this assumption. Whether we like it or not, it is automatically assumed. Second, we assume that the capital structure, capital structure of the company does not change. Capital structure of the company, no change. For example, say the company is equity capital, debt capital. There are two, two main sources of capital, equity and debt. Say equity, 150 million, debt, say 50 million. So, total capital, 200 million. This is the total capital of the company. So, what is the capital structure means? How your company capital is made up of equity and debt or how your company total assets have been financed by equity how much, debt how much. So, if you take the 
capital structure, we can see that out of 200 million, 75 percentage funded by equity holders, 50 percent or 25 percentage funded by debt holders. So, total out of 100 percent, 75 and 25 is your equity debt component. This is how your capital structure is. So, the assumption what we are making in the WACC computation, we think what the company present capital structure will be remaining even after new project is accepted. So, whatever the capital structure we have at the moment, 75, 25 capital structure, new project when we go to invest, definitely we are getting new funds, new investments we are going to make. That new funds, even if we take, we assume that same percentage of equity debt will be maintained. 75 percent, 25 percent equity and debt will be maintained even to invest in the, even to invest in the new project. So, the capital structure is assumed to be the same as what we have now even after new project is accepted. Because you all know that when you invest in new project, we are investing new capital. When you go to new capital, when you are going to invest, we are going to raise new capital. When you go to raise new capital, definitely your equity and debt will be changing. But the assumption is, even if you invest in new project, your new capital, even if you invest, your capital structure will remain to be 75-25 percent ratio. So, this example 75-25, but otherwise, your present capital structure will be maintained even after new project. Third, your new project, your new project capital or the new project funding will be marginal, marginal to the company. Your new project funding, new project funding or new project funding will be marginal to the company. For example, say a larger company, larger company say 100 billion worth company, 100 billion worth company going to raise money, 100 billion worth company raise money and then they put uh, 100 billion company going to invest in a new project say 2 billion. It's 100 billion company investing 2 billion. Now, the 2 billion company new project is a large investment or marginal? It's very marginal. So, present capital structure or present WACC will not change just because you are investing in a new company. So, please note these assumptions are made based uh, new these assumptions are made whenever we use WACC to evaluate investment appraisal. So, when we are evaluating a new project, if we are using present WACC, we are assuming this thing. So, if you realize your assumptions are no valid, then ideally your present WACC should not be used to evaluate new project. You have to calculate your marginal cost of capital and or the new cost and calculate your WACC and then again calculate your project feasibility. You should not depend on your present WACC. Okay. So, the cost of capital if you looked at, we have discussed about cost of equity, cost of debt and preferential cost and WACC. So, we know that there are four types of cost we will be having. So, in evaluating projects, evaluating projects, the WACC will play a major role most of the time because WACC will be used to discount operational cash flows. Please note this. WS will be used most of the time to discount operational cash flows. Operational cost cash flow mean EBIT cash flows. EBIT cash flow. This is before the financing cash flow. So, even your project evaluation or free cash flow based valuations, please remember and note that your cash flows are before financing, before financing. If you are using WSEC, it is operational cash flow before the financing cash flow. If you are using cost of equity to discount your cash flows, that cash flow should be your profit after tax cash flows, profit after tax cash flows, which means this is after, after financing cash flows. So, you will always remember to take it when you are taking cost of equity, you will take the profit after tax cash flow even after financing cash flow. So, whatever the 
cash flow you pay as financing cash flow you take all the cash flow lift after that whatever left over only will be discounting using cost of equity so there are two things one is wacc other one is cost of equity wacc will be discounting mostly on the operational cash flow that is ebit cash flows and cost of equity will be used profit of tax cash flows after financing cash flows so keep that in mind so in terms of cost of capital just to get an idea cost of debt cost of equity which is cheaper cost of debt or cost of equity which is cheaper cost of debt is always cheaper cost of debt debt is cheaper than cost of equity cost of debt is cheaper than cost of equity why the reason being if you take the debt holders and the shareholders or the share investors if you take debt holders and share investors as a investor when you are investing in a debt instrument like debenture or investing in shares which is more risky the instrument debt instrument whatever you are getting in debenture is comparatively lower risk whereas the share investment you are making have higher risk so please note debt instrument will have lower risk than the shares which are higher risk why do we call that as higher risk if you are investing in shares what is your priority from the company point of view company will take the debt test priority in terms of paying interest and in terms of winding up at the winding up in terms of repayment of capital who gets the money first debt holders they told us get priority in getting one the return two capital distribution capital distribution so please note that they told us whoever invest in debt instrument will be getting the priority in getting the return which is interest generally they told us and capital distribution at the winding up the capital will be distributed first to the debt holders before the shareholders so the risk for the debt holders is comparatively lower than the shareholder why if the company make losses if the company make losses still the debt holder gets the money return even if the company loss making company still the banks will be paid their interest the shareholder will not be paid anything so therefore the debt holder point of view is safer than the shareholder since safe say they are safe their risk is low since as an investor of debt instrument you are having a lower risk you are expected return you are expected return is what lower yes expected return is low whereas the shareholder point of view shareholder point of view you have higher risk in investment so you expect expect return i so please note that debt holders or debt investors expect the lower return shareholders expect higher return why because i take more risk in shares i take lesser risk in debt so that is the reason why your cost of debt is cheaper and cost of equity is expensive because we are talking from this investor point of view other one is a company point of view so company if they are taking they told the money they told they want lower return so if the company knows that debt holder are requiring a lower return the cost of debt the cost of using debt holder money is cheaper than cost of equity which is shareholders expected return is higher i think you are clear there so you are two parties debt holder and shareholders debt holder cost is cheaper shareholder cost is expensive so when we are talking about funding the company funding the company funding the company how we should fund whether we should fund through shareholder money or debt holder money because we have got two choices main choices shareholder funds and debt holder funds so we can take 
both funds and run the company. Or we can depend 100% on the shareholder funds. We don't take the borrowings. We don't go to bank or we don't issue debentures to raise money. So we have a choice either to use shareholder funds or we have issue or we have a choice of issuing debentures and raise money. Or we have mix. So what is the best way of doing it? We just now looked at your cost of debt is cost of debt is cheaper than cost of equity. So if you understand this very clearly, cost of debt is cheaper than cost of equity, how you should be funding? Whether you should be funding from 100% from shareholder funds or we should use debt holders, debt holder funds also. The answer is we have to use debt holder funds. That's what we call gearing, gearing, where you take borrowed funds and run your organization while you have in the shareholder funds. So you need to know that why we do that because cost of debt is cheaper than cost of equity. Now, for example, for example, say a company have an investment opportunity, investment opportunity, which gives you 20% return per annum. Investment opportunity is there, 20% per annum. And that capital needed, capital need for that investment, say 200 million. Investment opportunity 20% and capital need is 200 million. You have a choice, say option 1, option 1. You have equity money that is shareholder funds and debt holder funds. Option 1, you are going to raise the 200 million purely from shareholder funds 200 million and debt holder money you are not taking. So 200 million you are taking from shareholder only. Option 2, option 2. You are taking 100 million from shareholders, 100 million from debt holders, total 200 million. And the investor who are shareholders, they expect a return. They expect a return. Now say the shareholders are expecting a return. They are expected return is say 18%. Expected return is 18 percent. Debt holders expect a return, say 10 percent. 200 million investors expecting a return of 18 percent. Debt holder, there is no debt holder, but debt holders in the market expect a 10 percent return. Option two, we say expect a return will increase because there is a debt in the company. So they expect a return of the option two of the shareholder. Say for example, say 19 percent, expected return is 19 percent, where the debt holder return expectation is 10 percent, same 10 percent. This is what the picture is. You have investment opportunity where you can get 20 percent return and 200 million capital need and you have option of financing 200 million from shareholder funds and debt holder you do not take any money. You have another choice where you get 100 million from debt holders, 100 million from equity holders and the expected returns are given. Now take the option 1. Option 1, shareholders return, not the expected, the return what you are going to get. He gets 200 million, 200 million he puts in the business he, and he gets a return of how much? 20%. So 200 million he puts, 200 million he puts, 20 percent he gets, so his amount of return 40 million, he gets 40 million. Option 2, option 2, 200 million you take, invest in the project 200 million and you get, you get the total return, total return 40 million. 200 million into 20 percent, 40 million you get. That 40 million, you first pay debt told. Debt told. How much debt told I wants? 100 million, 10 percent. So debt told you pay. Once you pay the debt told 100 million to 10 percent, 10 million, 
you are left with 30 million. This goes to shareholder. Shareholder is the final recipient. So he gets 30 million. How much shareholder invested? Shareholder investment is how much? 100 million. And return percentage, shareholder gets how much? 30 percent. Option one, shareholder gets a return of how much? 20 percent. Option two, shareholder gets a return of how much? 30 percent. So, how he got extra return? How he, how he got extra return? Shareholder was able to earn more return simply by what? You are mixing the debt capital. In other words, gearing. You have borrowed money, you have borrowed money and invested. So, please note, when we are having opportunity of borrowing money, that borrowed money cost should be cheaper than your investment anyway. If it is cheaper than your investment return, sorry, your borrowing money will definitely benefit the shareholders to get higher return. So, otherwise, you would have got 20 percent for shareholder. If you just put the shareholder money only, you would have earned 20 percent and shareholder would have got 20 percent, good return. But, shareholder would have been able to get 30 percent if they have used wisely the debt holder money in the capital structure. So, debt holder money generally is lower cost than the shareholder money. So, you can borrow money at 10 percent and invest in business which will earn more than 10 percent, that is 20 percent, the extra 10 percent also goes to the shareholders. So, shareholders are benefited by gearing the company. So, please understand this logic. This is actually the key part of debt capital in the world, corporate world. Everybody wants to borrow money. Why want to borrow money? In order to maximize shareholder wealth. Because primary objective of corporate world is what? Maximizing shareholder wealth. So, in order to do that, you can use the gearing to make sure that you get, shareholder gets more return from the final company's return. Only thing, then you go to borrow money, your cost of debt, cost of debt has to be cheaper than your return what you are going to get. So, your investment return should be more than your cost of debt. As far as they are, as far as that condition is there, it is always advisable to borrow money and invest. That is the primarily the gearing is will, gearing will benefit the investor or shareholders if the return is more than cost of debt, shareholder will benefit. Only thing, if you have this condition always, then is it good to take 100 percent debt capital and invest? The answer is no, because after a point of gearing, say 50, 50, 60 percent levels, you are okay, still you are managing. 75, 80 percent level of gearing. When the company goes to 75, 80 percent gearing, you are in a very higher risk position. Your financial risk is very high. What is the problem? If your businesses or in the corporate world, if the businesses are growing like that, even if you are at higher gearing, you are in a safer wicket because your company is growing. So, you are profitable, your cash flows are there, you can meet all your liability. But this business cycle can be like this, downward. So, when it comes downward, your interest cost is a fixed. Whether you like it or not, whether you are profitable or not, you have to pay the interest to the bank. You have to repay your capital to the bank. You cannot ignore those things. Shareholders you can ignore, but not the in, uh, debt holders, because they will ask for your money regular basis. If you do not pay, they may use the Paratha execution to sell your properties and they will legal, file a legal case. The shareholder, if the company, loss making company, shareholder is going to file case and say that you are not given my return or dividend or whatever, because the company, the company's act does not allow you to uh, force the company to pay dividend. Right? It is only a request you can make. But debt holders always can force the company to pay their returns, interest or capital repayment. So, please note, when the businesses are downward, businesses are recession period, then you are in higher risk when you have a high geared company. So, the IGA company will be having a problem of going into bankruptcy in a serious level when your businesses are downward. Now, say take today's context. The COVID-19 has disturbed many companies, many organizations world over. At this point in time, if you are IGA company, if you are IGA company, you are in very bad wicket. Why? 
those situations you cannot meet your liabilities or you cannot pay your interest costs to the financial institutions because your businesses are making losses. At that time, you will have a chance of becoming failure. You would have heard in the papers and news that many organizations world over are going for bankruptcy. Right? Why they go for bankruptcy? Because they cannot survive. Business are dropping, but you have borrowed money heavily. So if you are borrowed heavily and your business are down, you can't meet that, you have to close it. But at the same time, when you are, things are better and you are a growing company, even at a very high gearing, you may survive. You may survive. So that's a good thing. You may survive and you make money out of the company when the company is growing in terms of business and they have a booming situation. But when the recession is time, it's very dangerous to face the high gear company. So it's always advisable, even though cost of debt could be cheaper, it's advisable to go to a reasonable gearing, so 60%, 70% and latest you can have. After that, you should not borrow money. You should not get into that gearing level. Maybe somebody will say, today the interest rates are lower. Why don't you borrow money and invest? Okay, you can borrow, provided you go to a some level. It's like you're going in an uh, expressway, Everyone knows expressway have a limit of 100 km speed, but you would like to go even at 200 km speed. So what's the answer? You have the risk of running that. 100 km speed is very advisable in that road because they know one, it's a one way traffic, there is no problem, you can go easily, no one is going to have overtaking and serious overtaking, so you, you are not worried about it. But you don't advise anyone to go at 200 speed, why? There is a risk. There is a risk, a danger. Same thing for a gearing company. Same thing for a gearing company. 50% gearing, 60% gearing, still you're okay. But don't go to 80% gearing just because rates are lower or markets are doing well. And there are always any business world, any business situation, you will have the upwards and downwards. Not always you will have only upward situation. That's only short term. There's a period you can have, upward trend. Then there is a shortfall, uh, there is a fall, fall of that market, any business. It can be Sri Lanka, it can be any country, you will see that upwards and downwards. So we have to be careful in deciding. I am not only talking from the exam point of view, I am telling this is a knowledge you should be carrying throughout your finance career. The gearing is always good, provided your return is more than cost of debt. That means you can borrow at 10% and invest in a business which gives you 20%. So the 10% extra goes to shareholders, what we we'll saw here. So shareholders are very happy about it. So it's basically making return for shareholder. Primary objective is achieved by borrowing money and investing. Only thing, there is a limit for your gearing. Don't go beyond a certain amount. 70-80 percentage is very high gearing. So stop at that point. 50-60 is very okay, reasonable levels, right? Because you still make money for shareholder. But after that, you are running into a very dangerous zone which may give you return for a short while, but suddenly you will disappear. It's like going at 250 km speed in highway and then suddenly you disappear. So do you would like to do that? That's up to you. But most of the time, the advice is that gearing is good, provided your return is more than cost of debt. Return is more than cost of debt. So we move on to capital structure, the chapter 10 in your study pack. So what is capital structure? How your company's assets have been financed? How your company assets have been financed? So the assets are generally financed by various sources. So we generally look at two sources as a key sources of funding, equity and debt capital. So your capital structure, say example, equity is 100 million, debt is 100, so you're 200 million. So how your company has funded your assets of the company? 50% equity, 50% debt capital. So this is the, simply the definition of capital structure, how your assets have been funded or how your capital had been uh, used in the sense like how much equity capital, how much debt capital you are used in your company. So here it's 50 percent age, so it's 50 percent. So if the debt capital had been used more than 50 percent, then you call, if it is more than 50 percent, we call high geared company, high geared company if it is more than 50 percent. If it is less than 50 percent, we say low geared company. So please note, if your 
debt capital out of total capital structure, fifth, more than 50 percent debt capital, then you call I geared company, otherwise it is a low geared company. So, that is for the definition purpose. Now, we as is slightly we touched upon earlier on this debt side. What is the benefits of debt capital? What is the benefits of debt capital? So if you take debt capital, we are borrowing money. We are borrowing money. Benefits of debt capital is what? When you borrow money, one is it is a cheaper cost. It is a cheaper cost of capital. Debt capital is a cheaper cost compared to cost of equity. So, we know that is a cheaper. That is one main advantage. Second, tax benefit. You have tax benefit on interest from inland revenue. So, you can claim tax benefit for the interest that you pay to the financial institution. So, there is a very big benefit of tax on your interest. Third, when you borrow money, you are not dilution, no dilution, no dilution of ownership, no dilution of ownership. If you are issuing shares to the shareholders, your shares ownership get diluted. But when you are issuing debt capital, no dilution of ownership, no dilution of earnings. No dilution of ownership, no dilution of earnings. So, you will see that the debt capital has advantage of this and you do not have a uh, what you call the extra profit sharing extra profit sharing. In a shareholders, you have to share the extra profits to shareholders. But debt capital, if you are fixed 8 percent interest rate or 10 percent interest rate, only that you have to pay the debt holder. No extra profit sharing with the debt holder. Then, if you want to take money only for short period, 5 years or 3 years, then you can take the debt holders money. Generally, the shares we do not issue for 3 years or 5 years. Shares when we issue, it is a long term instrument, you do not recall. Unless it is a real need, you repurchase your shares, otherwise, you do not repurchase the shares. So, the debt capital, the advantage you will have is for short period, you can issue debt instrument. For short period, you can borrow money. So, these are few of the advantages you might look at in your study pack further things. So, these are some of the benefits you will have in your debt capital. What are the negatives? What are negatives or disadvantages of the debt instrument? Negatives or disadvantages? Disadvantage is when you take debt capital, whether you are a profit, profitable organization or loss making organization, you are supposed to pay interest. So, you need to see that there is a committed committed finance cost, committed finance cost and capital repayment, capital repayment, committed finance cost and capital repayments you will have in the debt capital. Second, most of the time to borrow money you have to provide security. You need to provide a asset as security to be provided. So, that is another disadvantage the companies which do not have uh, properties and uh, assets to be given as a mortgage may not be able to borrow money. Whereas, the shareholder money is where if you have good shareholders who will give money even though you do not give any security to them. So, that is another disadvantage of having a loan capital. Third, when you borrow money, you are increasing financial, financial risk of the company. Please note, when you are borrowing money, you are increasing the financial risk of the company. So, what is this financial risk? When you borrow money, you are supposed to pay the committed finance cost. The committed finance cost will vary or uh, impact the profits available to shareholder. So, when you have borrowed money, even if the company makes some profits, that profit will be just given it to the finance cost. That means, they told us. Therefore, the financial risk increases when you have more and more debt capital. So, please note that the shareholders will be affected by this borrowing of the company because borrowing will definitely result in committed finance costs and the capital repayment. 
So therefore, the shareholders will get affected on that side. So there is a financial risk. Then the negatives. Sometimes when you don't pay your debt properly, the default default could result in default of interest, default of capital payment could result in bankruptcy of the company. Bankruptcy of the company. If you default interest, if you default capital, the bankruptcy is possibility because the bank will or the financial institution file case against you and they will uh, execute the parate execution and you will, uh, will not be able to continue your business. The operation will get stopped. So therefore, there are negatives of having debt capital in your company. So please understand that financial risk, security issue and your finance commitment of financial finance cost and capital repayment and the default situation you may be forced to go for the bankruptcy. So in the capital structure, you will see that when the company go for gearing, that is where you are borrowing money to finance your company assets, you are going for borrowing. So you can decide as we earlier explained that when you borrow money, you have a benefit to the shareholder to earn more return from the company. So shareholders also prefer the borrowing sometimes because they understand that by borrowing at your cost of debt could be say 10 percent and your return on assets could be 15 percent. So that extra 5 percent shareholder will be able to get for the money what the debt holder have invested. So there is a benefit what we looked at in the previous example. So these are always beneficial for shareholders when you are going for gearing. But when the gearing increases, your financial risk is increasing your financial risk is increasing. When the gearing increases, your financial risk is increasing. Since the financial risk is increasing, the shareholders, shareholders expect higher return. Shareholders expect higher return. Earlier discussion we looked at when the beta is higher, when the beta is higher, the shareholders expect more return from the company. So please note that when you borrow money, you are increasing the financial risk. When you increase the financial risk, the shareholders expect a return increases. So these are reasonable uh, linkages what you have in gearing between the variables. Then in terms of capital structure, few things we need to learn that is how to calculate gearing ratio. Even though the uh, textbooks, study packs, talks of there are various ways of calculating gearing ratio, which is very prominent, uh, what you call the mostly used gearing ratio. You can see debt capital divided by equity plus debt. Debt capital divided by equity plus debt. When we say debt here, this is actually long term nature debt long term nature debt or interest bearing interest bearing liabilities long term nature very important here what do you mean by long term nature i said at the beginning when we are discussing you might have short term loan or bank overdraft you might have short term loan or bank overdraft when you have short term loans or bank overdraft this short term loan and bank overdraft generally in accounts, it is all short term current liability. Short term loans or bank overdraft, it is a current liability. But if the short terms and bank, bank overdraft had been used many years continuously and your company needs that for the running of the business, you need that, then this short term loans and bank overdraft which are in your current liability is actually a long term nature debt long term nature debt. So please be aware that even though in your accounts because I would say like some of the case study questions in your past papers will have short term loans and bank overdraft. Now the question is whether these are debt capital. You need to think that whether this short term loans and bank overdraft is there all three four years 
significant amount, that means you are depending on that. If you are depending on it, which is a long term nature. Right? So please note that even if you are not very clear, then you have to make an assumption very clearly that you consider because it has been there for a few years, it is a long term nature. So you take it as part of debt capital of your capital structure. So gearing ratio when you compute, the debt capital needs to be long term nature interest bearing debt or interest bearing loans, which could include short term loans if those are used regularly and long run we have been depending on then it's a part of debt capital. So this is your gearing ratio calculation. And other important thing, all three this equity and debt capital, equity and debt capital has to be market value. Why we use this market value? Because market value represents the true value of this company. Market value represents true value of the company. Your book value might have a very large balance sheet value, but sometimes in the market you don't have value. Similarly, your book value may be smaller, the market value will be larger. So market value is the one which we will recommend from financial management point of view to be used for all these calculations. Like what we earlier mentioned, WSEC computation always use the market value. If you don't have market value, you might use the book value. But recommended, try much as possible get the market value because that reflects the true value of the equity, true value of the debt capital. So you will be knowing what is the exact gearing of your company based on a market value. Okay. The other thing which, you, which is uh, related to gearing is the interest cover, interest cover calculation. Interest cover calculation which also reflects the gearing levels of the company. How do you calculate? That is EBIT divided by interest. So EBIT is earning before interest tax divided by interest. That gives you how many times, how many times of interest your profits is made up made up of. So if you say the interest is 10 million and EBIT is 100 million, that means your company earns 10 times of interest as profits. So it reflects that you have enough money to pay the interest, one. Second, your company is lower geared company. Your company lower geared company. So it can be both. One, your company have enough profits to pay off the interest. Second, your company low geared company in the total picture. So this is a, another ratio which also indicates how your gearing is, whether you are highly geared company or low geared company. Then there are theories on capital structure, theories on the capital structure. This, these are sometimes the areas you may have difficulty or maybe not very interesting from the understanding point of view, but these are very important areas where the examiner continues to test on it, right? Theories on capital structure. There are two theories mainly. One is traditional theory traditional theory. Second one is Modigliani and Miller theory. Modigliani and Miller theory. So you might refer page and page 280. Page 280. Page 280 which talks about traditional theory and the Modigliani Miller theory. So what is traditional theory? If you look at a graphical picture, you can see that it is basically You will see this is the WACC, this is your cost of equity and this is your cost of debt and these are the gearing levels. This is equity 100 percentage level, debt is 0, you might see the equity 75, debt is 25, like that it goes, 
equal to 50, date 50, equal to 25, date T is 75. So, your gearing levels are increasing over the levels. So, when the gearing levels increases, this is a traditional theory I am talking, traditional theory. When the gearing increases, you will see that your cost of equity increases. Why? Earlier we mentioned that when you say you borrow money, when you see borrowing money from the market, your financial risk increases. When your financial risk increases, the shareholders or the investors realize that I am taking more risk in that company because they are borrowing more and more money. So, when they borrow more and more money, investor would like to get more return or expect more return. So, that is why you are gearing increases, your cost of equity is going up. The other side, your WACC, which is a mixed cost of capital, when you see gearing is increasing for a period, period or levels, your WAC comes down up to a point and when the gearing further increases, WACC increases. Now, when you see this drop, why the WACC is dropping? Mainly the WACC is dropping because your gearing is increasing mean you are introducing debt capital with a lower cost of capital in your capital structure. It, at this point, you have only equity capital, 100 percent. But when you say you are going on these levels, you are introducing more and more debt capital. So, when you introduce debt capital continuously, you are introducing lower cost debt capital than the cost of equity. So, when you mix it, your WC comes down. After a point, your WC start increasing. Why? Because your cost of equity is continue to increase. The shareholders are expecting more and more return. So, since they are expecting more and more return, your WC also increases. So, please understand the lowest point, lowest point on your WACC is the optimal capital structure, optimal capital structure. This is a traditional view, traditional view. You can read that in the syllabus, what you call study pack. So, the gearing increases, your cost of equity increase continuously. WAC comes down up to a point and it increases, cost of debt no change. This is a traditional view, which is a reasonable reflection of the market environment also, because generally when the gearing increases, WAC comes down. And then after a point, WAC goes up. Cost of debt, when you see, to a great extent, it is same cost of debt, but extreme levels of gearing, you will see cost of debt is increasing. That is traditional view. Then we have the other theory called Modigliani and Miller, Modigliani and Miller theory. There are two people who researched on it and they came up with this theory. So, you will have under Modigliani and Miller, Roman number 1, Roman number 2 if you want, Modigliani and Miller, Miller 1, Modigliani and Miller 2, the theory. So, that is 1 is about no taxation, no taxation in the corporate world. 2 is about including tax, including tax. So, Modigliani Miller 1 talks about no tax. They believe that there is no tax in the corporate world. How these variables react to the gearing increases? So, when you say the same thing earlier what we mentioned for the traditional view, gearing levels, gearing levels, when you say this is equity 100, debt is 0, then equity is 75, Debt 25, then the only 50, debt 50, so that gearing is going up. According to MNM1, MNM1, you will see that your WACC no change. Cost of debt is no change, and you have cost of equity upward going. Cost of equity upward going. Like the traditional view, cost of equity continues to increase simply because your gearing is increasing. When your gearing continues to increase, cost of equity increases. Why? When the gearing increases, the company financial risk increases. So, shareholders are a little worried about their financial risk is going up because of the company borrowing continuously. They expect more return from the company. So, the cost of equity continuously increases when the gearing goes up because of financial risk. 
according to MNM1, when there is no, to no tax in the corporate world, what he says, in the long run, in the long run, or the short run, in the long run, please note that this is mainly based on long run, according to MNM1, when there is no taxation in the corporate world, in the long run, he says, WSE will not change. WSC will not change. Because cost of equity, even though it increases, when you see WACC, it gets adjusted. It gets adjusted just because you are changing the gearing up or down, your WACC will not have a change. Because people do not uh, react to this, even though the short run they may react, but the long run they do not see much variation. So your cost of debt and WAC when you combine both together, your WACC will be more or less in the long run, same WACC. So please note that. This is MNM1 theory. According to that, there is no impact on WACC. Then we are talking about MNM2, that is with the taxation. That is with the taxation. Same thing, the gearing levels. Gearing levels. You will see the cost of equity going up. All three theories. Cost of equity goes up, WACC comes down, and cost of debt, no change, slight increase at the last. So, WACC is going down. Cost of equity going up, we know that it is because of financial risk. WACC is going down continuously. According to MNM2, he says due to the taxation, taxation is in the corporate world, the debt holders' interest cost will have a benefit of tax. So, if the company has borrowed money, that borrowed money has an interest, that interest has a tax saving. Due to that, the cost of debt will be cheaper. So, cost of debt will drive the WACC, WACC continue to drop. So, that is MNM2. So, please note that MNM2 says WACC will continue to drop mainly because you are using debt capital which is a uh, cheaper cost out of the total cost of capital of cost of equity or other cost. So, therefore, WACC continue to drop. That is the advantage of MNM2 explanation that when you borrow more and more money, your WAC can be reduced. As we know, as we know, the WACC and market value has a relationship. What is the relationship? WACC and market value are relationship. What is the relationship we have? When the WACC comes down, what happens to market value? Market value goes up. When the WACC goes up, market value comes down. In other words, they have, these two variables have inverse relationship. Inverse relationship. Please note, WACC and market value as inverse relationship. Here the market value, what do you mean by debt plus equity market value? Debt plus equity market value. So, we might be uh, seeing this in the free cash flow based valuation, where the WACC is a market value relationship, where it has an inverse relationship. Similarly, even for the capital structure related information MNM1, MNM2, it is more than MNM1, MNM2, you will see that WCC and market value have inverse relationship. The other thing, cost of equity and market value of equity has what relationship? Again, cost of equity goes up, market value equity comes down. Cost of equity goes down, market value equity goes up. This is what you would have seen in the formula for valuation chapter market value of share equals to dividend divided by required rate of return or cost of equity. Market value equals to under constant dividend valuation model, dividend divided by cost of equity. So, when you see that cost of equity goes up, market value comes down. So, this is a relationship what you should be knowing between these two variables, cost of equity and market value and WSEC and market value. Please take this down because this is something uh, rather than you memorizing, whenever you read the question or attempt to understand certain things affecting this variable, 
your knowledge is to be very clear that these have an in relation, uh, in inverse relationship. So when there is a interest rates increasing in the market, you need to know that W is going to go up. When the W is going to go up, your market value will drop. So whenever we understand interest rates are going up in the market, market value will be dropping. Now one good thing if you see at this moment in the country, interest rates have fallen drastically. Significant reduction in interest rate. So one of the thing you will observe here, when the interest rate is going down continuously, the market values have to go up. So what market values in stock market you would have seen that last couple of weeks, the share market has gone up. So that basically a one macro relationship, interest rates and the market value. So that same thing here we are talking, when the cost comes down, finance cost comes down, market value goes up. It's an inverse relationship. So one of the government's idea is to take some of the funds from government securities or fixed deposits where the people are deposited or invested to shift from those investment opportunity to moving to the other various alternatives which could be the properties, which could be the businesses, which could be the share market. So we are shifting, we would see that people are shifting their money from traditional government securities, fixed deposit, return giving investments to share market and even other businesses, other uh, projects or properties, they will shift. Why? There is no sufficient return, they get it from the fixed deposit or government securities, so they have to move into the other investment alternative. So please understand that interest rate falling at the good, good case study, this to today's context in Sri Lanka, we learn that because their rates have fallen, so we should be able to see what's happening on the other alternative. So you would see on a long run, the money should be getting shifted to various alternative investments, so the investments will be picking up, the market value will be going up. One of the important formula under MNM theory 2, MNM theory 2, that is value of the geared company, value, market value of the geared company, but they say value of the ungeared company, value of the ungeared company plus D into T, this is actually debt capital, debt capital and T stands for tax rate, tax rate. So please note, this is very important, ungeared company, ungeared company plus DT equals a geared company value. So when you take a geared company, mean you have borrowed money, your company are borrowing. So if you take a geared company value, which will be equal to ungeared company market value, whatever the ungeared company market value, plus D into T. D into T means debt capital, whatever the debt capital the company has, into the tax rate, tax rate. Actually, this is the logical uh, supporting of a DT is, it's a present value of, present value of tax saving, present value of tax saving on interest on debt capital. present value of tax saving on interest on debt capital, that is your DT. So you will see that in a geared company you have debt capital, so debt capital you have to pay interest, that interest will be able to claim tax saving from inland revenue. So every year when you have a debt capital in your balance sheet, every year you are getting a benefit of tax. So that tax benefit not only for one year, if you say five year debenture, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, you have interest, one side you have interest, then you have tax saving. So you will have tax saving for year one to five. That take tax saving, you calculate the present value. So you calculate present value for each year tax saving, that total will be the DT. So please be aware that value of geared company equals to 
ungeared value, ungeared company value plus dt. So the advantage, advantage of gearing, advantage of debt capital in any corporate company is you are increasing the company wealth by dt. You are able to increase the wealth of the company by this amount. So the borrowing will have a benefit of creating wealth for the shareholders, creating wealth for the shareholders because this has a tax benefit. Shareholder money don't have tax benefit. Shareholder dividend doesn't have benefit. It's only the interest cost what you are paying to the debt holders have a tax benefit. So present value of that tax saving what you calculate, it can be five years, it can be infinite period. It can be infinite period. This formula is based on the infinite period assumption. Your debt is infinite period. That's a D into T. But if you are talking about five year debenture you have in your company, it's a five year tax saving present value is what you have as a value of geared company equals to value of ungeared plus present value of tax saving. Present value of tax saving. Present value of tax saving on interest. So please note, this formula is more relevant to a irredeemable debt, irredeemable debt. If you have irredeemable debt in your corporate balance sheet, you will see the value of geared equals to ungeared plus D into T. But if you have redeemable debt, value of ungeared company plus present value of tax saving on interest, you calculate it for number of years, your tax saving, present value, that you add it to your ungeared company, that will be value of geared company. So please note that Gearing has a benefit of creating wealth. Gearing has a benefit of wealth creation. So primary objective, primary objective of corporate world is to create shareholder wealth. So if you are going to maximize shareholder wealth, that maximization can be arrived even by doing the gearing. So one of the main financing strategies is to borrow money and invest. Borrow money and invest. So please keep in mind the capital structure theories, whatever we could think of in financial management, which will give you the support to understand borrowing money will create wealth, provided your cost of debt has to be cheaper than return on assets what you are making. Similarly, your gearing should not go beyond a certain level because that can be dangerous. So please note that this is the, some of the things that you are learning to get a, refresh your mind of your theories what you would have learned in your syllabus. So always the question comes in the corporate gearing is good or bad. What is the answer? In capital structure, we have debt capital and equity capital. So the gearing is good or bad for the company. The answer is it's not yes, it's not no. It's always what if. If your return on assets or return from the business is more than cost of debt, more than cost of debt, please note gearing is good. If the return on assets that you are going to make from the business is going to be more than cost of debt, please borrow money and invest in business so that excess, excess what you are going to get from the business will go to the shareholder. So shareholder will be happy, he is getting something extra. So that's the reason the gearing is good if this is the condition. Only thing, you should not go beyond uh, extreme gearing. As I mentioned, you should not borrow more than 75 percentage of capital structure. If you are going to do that, you are uh, already started running a uh, big uh, danger and you might fall into bankruptcy. So that's basically you should be keeping in mind. Gearing is good or bad, if it's always return on assets is more than cost of debt, then gearing is good. So you create wealth for shareholder. You create wealth for shareholder. So with that, 
I believe that we have touched upon two chapters, cost of capital and capital structure. So please revise the study pack and the revision kit. So and try some of the past papers. You would be able to uh, gather whatever we could do.